p.m. from Wings Etc. in Cape and Jackson. This is your chance to delve deep into the Red Hawks basketball season with head coach Rick Ray. So what do you say? Come on, let's go. Let's go. go. Let's go live to Wings Etc. on SEMO ESPN. And we welcome you in live to the Red Hawks Coaches Show. We are at Wings Etc. Now we're over in Jackson today. So if uh, if you might be thinking about Coming on over, swing over uh, to the Jackson location. We got a little bit more room over here in Jackson. You walk in the front door at Wings, take a right. We're back in the banquet room, so lots of room to spread out. People are filing in to enjoy lunch here at Wings, etc. And you can enjoy their 59-cent award-winning wings on Mondays. That's right. Uh, on Mondays, they go with uh, different specials, not only with their wings, but uh, drink specials as well. So Monday is a terrific day for their award-winning jumbo wings. And not just wings here, freshly made burgers, wraps, subs, quesadillas. If you want to go the entree salad route, uh, no problem. Smoked ribs are on the menu. And their appetizer lineup includes their ultimate nachos. I, I highly suggest if you like nachos, get their ultimate nachos. And they have the deep fried pickle spears. It is wings, etc. In Cape and Jackson, we are in the Jackson location today. We'll be back in Cape Girardeau next week. We'll be talking Red Hawks basketball here with head coach Rick Ray and the newly minted four-time Ohio Valley Conference Freshman of the Week, Denzel Mahoney, is going to join us. It was, uh, well, I don't even think it's been officially released yet, but uh, inside information. Uh, we are letting you know first that Denzel Mahoney, 20 points against SIU Edwardsville, 22 against Eastern Illinois. He is now a four-time winner of the OVC Freshman of the Week Award. Coach Rick Ray is here at the Jackson Wings location. Pretty nice honor for Denzel. People are starting to see, hey, this may be the best freshman in the conference. Yeah, um, to me, obviously, I'm biased uh, with my opinion, but uh, I think he's uh, the best freshman in the OVC. And, and to be honest with you, I, I don't think it's really close um, because uh, how many things he does on the court to help us win ball games and to help us to be competitive. Um, he has the ball in his hands so much and he's making so many decisions besides the point guard position. Um, the way we run our offense, that skilled forward position has a first has a ball in his hands more than anybody beyond the point guard. So, um, you know, to go on the road, and have a 20-point game and then another 22-point game just goes to show you that it doesn't affect him, the environment um, where he's at. So he, he's just been phenomenal for us, uh, the way he's grown as a basketball player, and, and really happy for him. What would you say, how would you describe his game, maybe the first uh, eight or nine games of his career? It looked like he was looking for the perimeter shot, the three-point shot a little bit more. Now he is not bashful about taking the ball to the basket. I mean, he'll take a ball into traffic where there may be a couple of defenders, and more often than not, he's either going to finish or get to the free throw line. Yeah, I think that's the evolution in his game that's changed the most. I, I thought in the first half of the season, especially in the non-conference, that he was settling for three-point jump shots. Even when he was shot fake or jab, he dribbled one or two times for a pull-up rather than trying to get to the rim. And, you know, the statistics show and analytics that, you know, the pull-up jump shot, which has become kind of ancient in the game of basketball, is really one of the worst shots that you can take if it's contested. And I thought he was taking contested three-point jump shots, and I thought he was taking contested two-point jump shots. But I think what he's starting to realize now is that people are so worried about his ability to make three-pointers that they're running at him. And because of the way our offense is set, he's always sprinting out to the three-point line after setting the ball screen. So he's creating a closeout with our offense. And so what I think he's done now is he started just to rip the ball through people and go to get to the rim and try to go through people's chin in order to finish. And he's drawing a lot of contact because of that. And because of how strong he is, um, the physicality of that, you know, that confrontation at the rim doesn't bother him. You think he plays bigger than 6'4"? Oh, there's no question about it, and that's why we're able to get away with playing him at that position. And the reason he plays big, better, uh, excuse me, bigger than six four is because of his strength. Um, he, he's probably, you know, one of our strongest guys on the team as an incoming freshman. Um, so he's able to play through some of the contact that most people shy away with um, as a freshman. So um, that really doesn't bother him. And I think also he plays bigger than that just because of his skill set. 
you know, at that point where he's able to dribble, pass, and shoot, then he becomes that threat. And so now, because of that fact, he's able to do so many different things. He had eight rebounds in the SIU Edwardsville game, Coach, uh, and seven more rebounds against Eastern Illinois. How would you characterize his development as a rebounder? That's something that we've really started to talk to him about as the season continued to go along was, hey, we need more help from you on the defensive glass. Um, you should be a guy that's getting somewhere between uh, six to eight defensive rebounds a game for us. The offensive rebounds will take those, but the defensive rebounds are way more important. We want him to be a presence on the offensive glass, but we feel it's much more important for him to be a presence on the defensive glass. And that's something that he's really started to do better as conference season has come into play here of going in there and getting defensive rebounds. And a lot of times, because of the way we switch on our ball screen defense, he's on the guard. Um, so he's able to come downhill, which is a strength for him, and get defensive rebounds for us. Uh, in the SIU Edwardsville game, you win it 71 to 67 last Thursday. That started your final road trip of the regular season SIU Edwardsville Thursday, Eastern Illinois Saturday. And you fell behind in that game, 18 to four. Uh, you fell behind by 12 points in the Eastern Illinois game. So you you dug yourself out of holes in both of the games, but specifically in Edwardsville, what was the message to your team when you looked up and they're up 18 to four? We know they're last in the league in field goal percentage, last in the league in three point shooting percentage. So them sustaining that early run that they went on was probably unlikely statistically. Uh, it would have been an anomaly if they would have, you know, shot high 50s for the entire game. But they got out of the gate really, really fast. Yeah, um, for us, some of the things that we pointed on that we need to make sure we understood. First of all, um, the scouting report was for us to close out short because they're such a hard driving team. They're second in the nation in free throw attempts. So we were really worried about those guys driving by us and getting contact. And because we don't have a lot of depth on our team at this point in time, it's really important that we stay out of foul trouble. So we were closing out short to those guys. And then Eslick, you know, hit about three threes, um, his first three attempts he hit. And so our, our assistant coaches kind of got panicked and, you know, they were getting mad of our guys for not closing out. I said, well, we told them to close out short. You know, that's a game plan. We're fine. we got to stick with it. Um, the second part of that is I thought we were beating ourselves with two things. One is, like, we were turning the ball over. And uh, I just thought they were unforced turnovers, and so that led to offense for them. And the other part of it was they were getting offensive rebounds. So I told them if we could just take care of the basketball and rebound the ball, we're going to be fine because I don't believe that they'll continue to hit the shots that they're making. Our defense was pretty solid. We had a couple breakdowns, but the breakdowns were because we were chasing them down off our own turnovers and we didn't get the defensive rebound. But we were in a half-court setting. Uh, I thought some of the shots they made wasn't going to carry out throughout the course of the game. Well, it was National Pizza Day on Thursday, so the first 150 students got free pizza. Then they gave out 400 T-shirts to the first 400 students. So they had a lot of students there. They got off to the great start. I mean, the crowd was really into the game. They were they were really backing the Cougars. You mentioned Barack Eslick, uh, their leading scorer, uh, 18 points in the game. But this is a guy that scored 40 against Moorhead State last year. I mean, he can score. He hit his first three, as you referenced. But then he was 0 for 7 from 3 to finish out the ball game. So whatever adjustments you made with him, uh, he w did not stay that hot as you probably predicted he would. Yeah, and I don't think we really made adjustments. just a law of averages. Um, he's shooting about 29% uh, from the three-point yep. line. And so he made his first three, and, and then he missed his next seven. So that's 30% for him. So I just thought it was a law average. I wish I could take credit for some sort of X and <laughs> so O you, deal. you could have said, did. man, we made this great <laughs> exotic adjustment and, and shut him down. No, no, it was just a law of averages that, that came out because I thought the shots that he made, our, our defense, except for one time, was actually pretty good because we were following the scouting report of closing out short because he's much more of a driver than he is a shooter. He's capable of doing both but he draws so much contact and so many fouls with his ability to drive the ball. It's kind of like a Manu Ginobili type of driver. Where he just puts his head down and he goes, and you're forced to either like foul him or, or give up the basket or he is a turnover. So um, he just puts a lot of pressure on you when he puts the ball on the deck. Even with that great hot start that they got off to, they only ended up shooting 36% from the field in the first half. So you're down 18-4. to four. It's a 14-point deficit, but you battle back, and it's a tie game at halftime. Yeah, and we did that with, with some guys in foul trouble, which typically happens for us because we have a short bench. 
Um, so we just wanted to get in. And once we got to halftime, I believe it was tied at halftime. Yep. Um, we, we talked about we have four minute wars. And, and so I told them all we need to do from this point on is win our four minute wars. We don't need to win them by three. We don't need to win them by four. We just need to win four minute wars every single time we come to a media timeout. If we're won that one, war by one point, we're good. And so that's what we focused in on is winning those four minute wars. And I said, we win our four minute wars. We win the game. So you look up at halftime and you're tied and you're trying to figure out a way. How are we going to contain Jalen Henry? He's a guy who's 6'8", 220. He finishes with 22 points and nine rebounds. He goes nine of 18 from the field, even hit a three-point shot. Uh, I said during the broadcast, I don't know why he doesn't touch it every – just at least touch it almost every time down the floor on offense. When you got a guy like that, uh, what a matchup nightmare he is. He really is a good player. Yeah, and the thing that makes him so difficult to guard is that he has the ability to drive by you because he's quick. He's kind of like Trey Kellen where he can catch the ball off the block and sweep and turn and go by you and finish at the rim. But he also has the ability to make that shot when he turns and face. You know, old school guys, we call that the Sigma move uh, from Jack Sigma, Jack Sigma. With, the, with the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, that's what they call that when you turn and face. But now more people are like Kevin Garnett or, or they call that move that. But he's got the ability to turn and face kind of off the block, kind of in that Carmelo Anthony, you know, 10 foot area range and make that shot. He can do it at 15 feet. So he's really hard to guard because he can shoot from that, but he can also drive you. Jack Sigma had some good years with the Supersonics, too. I did, did he win an NBA championship with Seattle? Yes, he did. That's right. I think uh, Gus Johnson or well, was, Gus was the uh, the point guard, and then he also had uh, – I forget the other guy on there, but they had a good team there. That was a fantastic team. That was back uh, in the time before they actually showed the NBA Finals live. When the Supersonics won it, I think they actually showed that on television tape delay back then. That, that tells you where the popularity of the NBA was and where it is now. Yeah, I think um, this was like the uh, NCAA championship. That was the first time that it wasn't tape delay when they showed the game between Magic and Bird with Indiana State and Michigan State. So all of those games, is, it used to be tape delayed. So it's amazing how far it's come. And, and Magic and Bird are a big reason that it wasn't on tape delay anymore too. Right, yeah. I think that's two pretty good reasons not to have it tape delayed. <laughs> So you beat SIU Edwardsville uh, in the second half of the game, Coach. You shoot 46%, uh, but I think uh, one of the big numbers, you outscored them 17-10 to 10 from the free throw line in the second half of the game, and, and overall 27-15 your advantage from the line, and this is the team that has the second most free throw attempts in all of college basketball, not just the conference, in the nation, 351 teams. Yeah, and that's a huge stat for us. We, we continually talk to our guys about we want to make more free throws than the other team attempts. And so in order for us to do that against a team that's second in the nation in free throw attempts, that means that we got to do two things. One is we've got to keep them off the free throw line. I thought we did a pretty good job of keeping them off the free throw line. And then the second thing is we've got to make sure that we attack the paint and get to the rim and draw contact. So I did, thought we did both of those things. And you get out of there with a victory. Um, Taj Edey, again, uh, had a nice game for you, and you brought him off the bench. Uh, it was a scenario you mentioned that uh, he was late for a meeting, no, nothing major, but enough for you to kind of say, hey, uh, we're, we're going to go ahead and bring you off the bench. Uh, did not affect his game, Coach. Five of seven from the field, 14 points, three rebounds, two steals, only one turnover in 28 minutes. Yeah, he's really playing well for us. If you look at his OVC stats, just the conference stats only, he's averaging in double figures um, for us. And we always knew that he'd be a guy that's capable of, of making shots for us. Um, he's really uh, calm with the basketball, does a good job of distributing the basketball, but he's a threat from the three-point line. He just has a knack for being able to score the basketball. So um, it, it's really good to have him on the court for us. And he's he's really improved on the defensive end. That was the one thing that was kind of holding him back from, from garnering more playing time. Again, we're going to have uh, Denzel Mahoney joining us here in just a few minutes. Uh, he just won his fourth OVC Freshman of the Week award. And he just walked in. And, Coach, the interesting thing about Denzel, he's your leading scorer in conference play. He's scoring almost a point more than Antonius Cleveland. Now, overall scoring, Antonius is your scoring leader. But in conference play, he's been the guy. 
Yeah, I tell you what, and it really puts the, the opposing team in the bond to try to figure out what they're going to do kind of with that combination. Um, when you have a ball screen between those two guys where you have Denzel setting the ball screen and Antonio is coming off the ball screen, it puts the team in the bond about how they're going to play the ball screen defense um, with them. And then on top of that, when people start to switch the ball screen, we have – Denzel slipped quite a bit, and when he slips to the rim, we tell guys to drive it because they're going to chase him out to the three-point line. So he's really done a good job of increasing his scoring. But, you know, more than anything is like him starting to figure out where he can affect the team on the offensive end. And he's starting to figure out like when he can drive the ball, when he can shoot the ball. And then also because of our offense, there's so much spacing out there that he's able to break his man down and make plays not just for himself but also for others. You know, if a guy can get to the line a lot uh, but is not a good free throw shooter, you know, it, it's just kind of give and take. Uh, it's not a, as effective for him to, you know, take the ball into the paint if he's not a good finisher and doesn't shoot the free throws well. But he's an excellent free throw shooter. I mean, uh, we're talking top 10 in the OVC, went 9 of 10 in that game against SIU Edwardsville. I mean, that's a dimension that a lot of freshmen that play his position don't bring to the table automatic type free throw shooter yeah and a lot of guys that you have that can shoot the basketball for some reason once they get to the free throw line that they, they change their routine and they have bad free throw technique um but for him like he shoots it the same way regardless of whether he's shooting a 15 footer or three or free throws um so we want our guys to make sure they concentrate on that like this morning um i just got off the road from recruiting and so our guys went in this morning and all they did was shoot 100 free throws and got up 200 shots. Um, and so it's something that we routinely always make sure our guys do. So since we don't play until Saturday, we all had them come in today, didn't tape, didn't brace, just had them shoot, get up a lot of shots. And against Eastern Illinois on uh, Saturday, uh, it was a little surprising. I think you missed five free throws in the first half of the game. We, we don't normally see that from you guys. Yeah, I, I was disappointed with the way we – shot our free throws in the first half, but I thought we got back to making our free throws there in the second half. Yep. But, you know, obviously it ends up being an overtime game, so one of those free throws could have came back to haunt us. You know, you talk about good shooters who may change something from the line. I don't know if Milos falls into that category, but you would think he would be a better free throw shooter because of how good of a shooter he really is. Yeah, Milos overthinks everything. He He's probably one of the most analytic guys that I've ever been around, not just as a basketball player or somebody I coach. I mean, he's so analytic and he wants to an answer to every scenario. So a lot of times we're going through scouting reports and we'll say like, well, hey, he's setting a down screen here. So he extend the down screen. He says, well, what if he goes this way? Well, you open up. What if he does it? I say, hey, Milos, man, you just got to play. You know I mean, I can't give you an answer for every single scenario that's going to happen on the court. And But that's the way he is. And I think he gets up there. And I know he knows exactly what he's shooting from the free throw line. I'm sure he knows the average of what he's shooting from the free throw line and in conference play and non conference play combined. I think that starts on to the just, road. Yeah. At home. I think it starts to like envelop him and he, just, he starts to overthink things at the free throw line instead of just going up there and shooting the ball. Because really, his numbers were actually better in Juco than they are this year from the free throw line. Yeah. You're talking about a guy that's shooting over 50% from the three point line in conference play. And his free throw percentage is not very good. That means that there's something mentally that's going on, not mechanically. And we mentioned that Denzel will be on. He uh, just came in to the uh, banquet room here at Wings. Ray Kowalski is here as well, who is redshirting as a freshman at Southeast. We don't talk much about Ray, but you were talking a little earlier about the physical strength of Denzel Mahoney as a freshman. A lot of guys come in, and that's the biggest thing. Uh, first of all, that they need to address when they come in and play Division One basketball. Sometimes it's a reason they may not be playing at a bigger school is because of their frame or maybe they're not big enough, uh, whereas maybe they've got the skill level to play at a bigger school, but physically they're just not big and strong enough. And there's another guy who may have a similar skill set who is bigger and stronger, and the school might go with that. Ray Kowalski is a guy physically that is strong enough to play Division One basketball right now, isn't he? Yeah, I thought with both Denzel and Ray that they wouldn't have any problem making that jump from high school basketball to college basketball and the physical aspect of it. I think most times when guys make that jump, the biggest adjustment they have is just the physical pounding that you take in college basketball as compared to high school. And then oftentimes you're talking about a 17, 18-year-old kid 
playing against guys that are 22, 21, 23 years old. Some guys are fifth year seniors. Some guys are transferred. And so it's really not fair because you're talking about a guy who's probably had four seasons of lifting in the offseason compared to one guy who had a summer weightlifting program. So, you know, I, I thought both with Ray and Denzel that the most the struggles that most young men have with the physical pounding of the game of basketball, um, they wouldn't. Now, they would have some other struggles, um, but I thought that was one thing that they wouldn't really have a problem with. And you sometimes forget uh, if you're a Red Hawk fan, hey, this injury thing has been a major storyline for this team. You expected to have Joel Angus full-time starter last year. You expected him to give you heavy minutes, if not be in the starting rotation a lot, maybe every game, don't know. Uh, but 11 minutes in Illinois, the hip just wasn't going to work. Season-ending surgery, he's out. Veteran guy, you were counting on heavy minutes. Uh, also, Dondre Duffus, who was a starter at the time that he went down. Great perimeter defender, guy with a lot of athleticism, and another guy who's physically strong that you brought in. Uh, and then Ray Kowalski who actually came to Southeast healthy, but he got hurt here, right? Well, he actually uh, – I, I think he probably played um, on a torn meniscus a little bit to end his senior year, and I think as it went along, it got worse and, and probably tore a little bit more. So he was probably damaged goods by the time he got yeah. here. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, we went on and had him scoped and uh, went in and they repaired that and actually had to go back and, and do it again um, simply because the meniscus had torn so much. Um, that the doctor said that at some point in time that they're going to have to go back in and repair it again because it was such a big tear that it's probably they probably weren't able to fix everything at that point in time. So that ended up happening again. Um, so um, he's been out for the whole season. And then you add on top of the fact that we also had um, Trey Kellum miss a few games because of injury. Five games. And then you also had Jamal Calvin miss a couple games because of injury. And then you also had William Changa initially going through the amateurism problem and now being ineligible because of grades. Um, we've had a lot of guys that we were depending on to help us, you know, be a good basketball team that are not available now. And so it really speaks to what our young men have really done this season um, by going through all this adversity and still being where they are at this point in time. But it also speaks to the depth um, that we have on this team. All right. Uh, let's get an injury update on these guys. Uh, anybody that gets to the games early, uh, where you might see the Red Hawks working out. Uh, well, I get there very early, but uh, you see Ray Kowalski out there working hard. He's always drenched in sweat doing a shooting drill or a running drill or some sort of exercise drill uh, apart from the team oftentimes. Uh, where is he in terms of his health right now with his knee? Well, he was back practicing with us and, and doing some things. You know, the, always the, the process is you, you get back and you get to – like being in a swimming pool where there's no like pounding on yourself. And then you go into where you're doing jogging. Then you get back to the point where you're doing like shooting drills. Um, then you get to where you're doing some cutting and things like that with no contact. And then the next evolution is like actually playing five on five basketball with contact. And Ray was to that point at that time. Um, but uh, he, he just got done um, going down hard on his hip. Um, so he's been out with that now. And so we're going to do a little bit more further investigation to try to figure out where he is with that. But he was back to actually playing five on five basketball. And I, I thought he gave us some great looks because he was always the opposing team and scouting team. So if we're getting ready for UT Martin, Jacoby Mobley, he, yeah, he'd be a guy that can make shots. And so he did that. He actually held our guys accountable because if they made mistakes on some sort of string D, he has the ability to knock down three point shots. And so it really gave us a good look getting ready for the opposing team. So his knee's good. Now we're worried about a hip. Yes. <laughs> all right. Uh, so Ray is here, and hopefully everything is all right with that. Now, Joel Langus, uh, it was a hip. It was something that was torn, and he did have to have surgery. And anybody that saw him over on the bench uh, saw him, you know, he was all wrapped up, and uh, he was limping, and, you know, that was immediately after surgery. But he's walking around now free and easy. How's his rehab coming? Well, he's actually doing some jogging now, um, which is uh, he's making great progress. It's amazing now. Um, with the way they do rehab. I mean, he was actually out walking, you know, two days later, um, trying to make sure that no, no scar tissue built up um, where they had the surgery at. So um, he's been doing a lot of work in the pool before he started jogging. So now he's actually doing some jogging now. This is still a long road for him. Um, he won't be, be able to do any cutting or anything like that for another few months. 
Um, but uh, it's good to see him jogging. And it's good for his mindset, too, because, you know, when you're sitting out and you've been playing basketball your whole life and not you're not able to do anything at all. I mean, it could be depressing. So him just getting a chance to get on the treadmill and do something and then also go through it without having experience in any pain. Um, it's really a good ego boost, uh, boost for Joel. Boy, think about uh, the guys that you're going to lose off of this team. Antonius Cleveland, Trey Kellum, Jamal Calvin, all seniors. How nice will it be to get Joel Angus back, a, a leader, a fifth-year senior, a guy who's been through a Division I season here? Yeah, I, I tell you what it's going to be huge for us. We we named him co-captain at the beginning of the season for a reason um, because we value his leadership and what he brings to the team. And so to be able to have him come back into the fold now with the same experience that he had before – but then also to him, it's probably going to be even more of a valuable experience because he understands now how precious, you know, basketball is to him. And so he's going to value that opportunity even more. Um, so to be good that we'll have somebody coming back into the program that we already expected for us to be a captain. And now we know we've got a captain coming back. Dondre Duffus, uh, it was a growing injury, right? Uh, and and it looked like it was getting better. Then it got worse. He had some treatment. Uh, give us the background on Dondre. Yeah, he's still totally inactive right now um, with that stress fracture. Um, so what they need to do is they just going to let that thing totally heal um, because it's such a, in a sensitive area right there. They really don't know for sure. Like it's uh, doctors were telling us, that you don't want him to sit out too long um, because now there's inactivity. And then when he comes back, there's a shock to it, which could cause a problem as far as the strex fracture. But you also want to let the strex fracture heal, too. So it's yeah. a, it, it's on his thigh. It's no, it's actually right in this pelvic area right oh, there. Okay. So right when his groin area. Um, but, uh, you know, he's still totally inactive right now. So at some point in time, hopefully we get him back uh, to doing something in the pool and then get him jogging. But there is no rush you know, right. in order to get him back because we medically redshirted him. Um, so well, that's, he, a, that's an odd injury. Have you ever seen that injury before? Well, it's, it's weird because we had two guys on the team um, with Jonathan Dalton and Dondre Duffus have the same exact injury. So uh, when Jonathan missed some time there early in the season, it was because of that same injury. So it's really a kind of a weird occurrence. All right. Uh, we'll talk more about Eastern Illinois after we talk with Denzel Mahoney. But uh, this is a guy who was the 8A Florida Player of the Year. That's the largest class in the state of Florida uh, as a junior. I mean, that, that's a pretty big honor for a junior. I would say more often than not, that honor probably goes to a senior basketball player. Tell us about the recruiting process with him because he injured his knee. Uh, if he does not injure his knee, you think you could still recruit him here to SEMO? Well, I would, I would hope that that's the case, but, um, you know, Denzel was getting recruited really hard by some schools in the local area right there, and he was a guy that played on a, a good AAU basketball team. But uh, to be honest with you, um, we got a couple connections down there in Florida, myself and Coach Moore, and um, they had told us about Denzel, and we used that July recruiting period to go out and get a chance to see him. And, um, and he probably won't remember this, but the first time I saw him, um, we're in, there in the layup lines, and I'm trying to go over and ask his Coach Anderson, you know, which one is he, and he points to him. Well, he's got these goggles on, <laughs> and, and 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 then so I'm, so right there I get some trepidation right there because I don't know how many guys that I've ever recruited that are good players that wear goggles, but but then he has these knee pads on, and and they're the old school like Patrick Ewan knee pads like the volleyball players wear, and so I'm like. I said, this guy can't play. There's no way that this guy can play. He's got on goggles and he's got on old school knee pads. Well, then the game starts and 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 then it totally changes. I thought um, from what I saw in the July recruiting period, Denzel was like the hardest playing person I saw the whole July evaluation period. He just played with such tenacity, was diving on loose balls, making extra plays, using the strength that he has to go get rebounds. And so I was thoroughly impressed with him because – you know, to me, I think college basketball has really changed where you got a covered skill. And so you need guys that can dribble, pass, and shoot. And it used to be a given that you go out and watch guys play 10 years ago or five years ago that them playing hard was going to happen. Well, now playing hard and playing tough has become a skill level, just like being able to shoot or pass or dribble. Um, so he possessed all those things. He played extremely hard. Um, he, he could dribble, he could pass, he could shoot. So, you know, I was really, really sold on him, and I was really more concerned about did we have a realistic chance of recruiting this young man. You know, he's from right outside of Orlando, Florida, and he has some schools that are, you know, pretty 
good mid-major schools recruiting him. So it became, quickly became like, how can he get to Southeast Missouri State? I always all about how can we get this young man? If you don't see an avenue to get him, I don't want to waste my time. Well, he ended up getting hurt in the July recruiting period and tearing his ACL. And, and some schools kind of backed off. And, and I just went in and I talked to his parents and I talked to him. The way that he attacks on the court, how hard he plays, he was a good student. The way he uh, prepares in the classroom, the way he attacks the weight room, I had zero concern about him coming back and rehabbing from that ACL injury because I had full faith that the way that he's going to attack in the rehab was going to be the same way he attacked on the court, in the classroom, in the weight room. So it didn't bother me at all about the ACL because if you do what you're supposed to do on your rehab, you're going to come back just fine, and that's what he did. He has hit 45 three-point baskets so far this year. His junior year, he hit 105. That's a lot of three-point shots for a high school player. Did you think he was more of a three-point guy when you when you first saw him? I thought he was more of a complete player. I, I thought that he could do so many different things because of his ability to shoot the ball. I think sometimes guys are three-point shooters, and, and that's all they can do. Um, but I thought he was a guy just because he can make three-pointers. Now people had to guard him, and he could, like, break them down in different ways so he could beat them off the bounce. He could make passes. He could get assists. He could get other people involved. He was a really good rebounder, and he had some toughness to him to be a good defender. All right. Uh, you've said several times, hey, I'd like to see a little more emotion. I'd like to see a fist pump or two out of Denzel. Are you starting to see a little more emotion? No. <laughs> No. I saw him give a fist pump at Tennessee State. He drew a charge and gave a fist pump. So I, I have seen a fist pump. Okay, I'm glad you witnessed it. I hadn't seen it. we got to get that on film. All right. <laughs> All right, we're going to talk with Denzel Mahoney, just named the OVC Freshman of the Week for the fourth time this season. He will join us when we return to Wings Etc. in Jackson. Coaches show on SEMO ESPN. Growing about Wings Etc. See, Wings Etc. has those award-winning jumbo wings. They're popular for both dine-in and carry-out. Now the word is getting out about Wings Etc.'s appetizer lineup. From the ultimate nachos to the deep-fried pickle spears, frankly, they're irresistible. Friends are sharing time together at Wings Etc. They've got dining rooms filled with HD TVs tuned to the best sports programming, including NFL Sunday Ticket. The people at the next table are talking about Wings Etc.'s daily half-pound lunch special, starting at just six forty-nine. Plus, Wings Etc. has food and drink specials throughout the week, including fifty-nine cent wings every Monday. Plus, there's the kids' menu, and Wings Etc. is family-friendly with video games in the dining room. And the whole community is excited about how Wings Etc. is locally owned and operated, and they're proud to support local athletes, their families, schools, and teams. I guess Wings Etc. is a really big deal around here. Ooh, not a charge, but a blocking foul. Looks like the referee may have made a questionable call there, Frank. Yeah, the fans are letting him know how much they... Hey, I care for you! Love that bad call. That's a strange turn of events. Well, actually, Frank, I think it's their way of telling him that he might need some vision assistance. Hey, Rap, why don't you go to Branson? I care for you, Rap! No, no, they want to send him to one of those Branson weekend getaways. In reality, it's their sweet way of telling him that if he's calling it the way he sees it, then he needs some vision correction from Dr. Branson at I Care For You. Dr. Branson and the staff are experts in providing the right glasses in a huge variety of frames. They even have the no-line progressive bifocals. You're starting to sound like a commercial there, Jim. Maybe that's because they are our sponsor. Visit I Care For You. Call 332-8500 for an appointment. And they're located at number one, Doctors Park in Cape. Don't you think we should tell the ref? Oh, he'll figure it out eventually. <laughs> and now, your ESPN Radio Network local local weather forecast. Looking at clear skies, and 31 is where we're headed for the overnight low. That's actually a few degrees on the high side of average. Some light winds also to deal with. We'll call it partly to mostly cloudy for our Monday. Run the temperature up to around 50. And then we'll build in the clouds for Monday night. Overnight low, mid to upper 30s. Looking at a sun and cloud mix Tuesday and a high 54 from the Weather Channel. You're up to date with the latest weather forecast. Breaking on the ESPN Radio Network. Well, dude, obviously you'd be better as the focal point of the show. Would I be better for society? No. Don't miss Rusillo and Cano. Every weekday at noon on CMO ESPN. <laughs> Thank you. 
Welcome back to Wings, etc. We are in the Jackson location today. It's the Red Hawks Coaches Show here from Wings. And don't forget, we'll be back in the Cape Girardeau location for the next couple of weeks. So we hope you'll join us over there, the Red Hawks Coaches Show. Uh, the one thing you'll notice when you walk into Wings, all of the high-definition flat screens, and they're all tuned in to the best sports programming, including – uh, Blues hockey. Blues are next in action on Wednesday. You can see the best college basketball games. You want to watch uh, and see if the UConn women can run their winning streak to 100. <laughs> I can't even believe I'm saying that. 100 consecutive games. They'll play against sixth ranked South Carolina tonight. You can watch it in high definition right here at Wings, etc., both in the Cape or the Jackson location. And uh, they're great, laid back atmosphere, comfortable meal quality here and of course their daily half pound lunch specials don't forget about those they start at just 649 compare that uh to some other places 649 is where their half pound lunch specials start they've got food and drink specials throughout the week including mondays their award-winning wings just 59 cents and if you uh go to a red hog basketball game and they win you bring your ticket stub in within 48 hours you get free four of their award-winning wings so you got a wing starter just for coming to the games and seeing the red hawks win and they're open seven days a week late on the weekends because the games run late and the hobbs family is in the house today joe and his lovely wife are sitting back there enjoying i'm not sure if he's if he's enjoying the the chicken nuggets maybe it's the chicken fingers or the, or the chicken wing. what's that what's that the grilled oh he's going grilled chicken today all right let's welcome in uh, denzel mahoney who was just named the ohio valley conference freshman of the week for the uh, fourth time this season that's pretty cool uh winning an award from the ohio valley conference how does that make you feel to know uh hey fourth time and it, the coaches vote on that or at least the sports information directors kind of get get input from the coaches but it's the sids that kind of vote uh how cool is that uh, four times you've been named freshman of the week uh, just pretty cool. Just know that my um, hard work's starting to pay off. Well, yeah, you're certainly a fan favorite so far as far as Red Hawk fans go. Now, give us uh, give us a little background because the first thing anybody notices about you uh, is the glasses, and you wear the the goggles during the game. Now, uh, I'm guessing they're prescription goggles. Uh, did you have to get them specially made? Give us a give us a little background on the goggles. On um, the goggles, um. I've been wearing them since sixth grade. Um, they are prescription, not fake, not for style. Um, <laughs> so they're not Russell Westbrook stuff then? No, they're the yeah. real deal. Yeah. Um, hmm. So you needed glasses when you were younger. Did you ever see any old footage of the NBA's all-time greatest scorer, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? He kind of made the goggles famous back in the day. Yeah, that's what I heard. I have seen some Kareem. Um, highlights. Well, he's seven foot two. You got a little ways to go if you're gonna <laughs> if you're gonna catch Kareem Abdul Jabbar. So you're from Oviedo. Make sure I pronounce it right. Oviedo. Oviedo. Yeah. Long E. Okay. Oviedo, yeah. Florida, and that's basically uh, a suburb, uh, kind of in Orlando and Kissimmee, right? Yes. So that's yeah. Disney World uh, area. How many times have you been to Disney World in your life? Um, probably five, handful. Not really a big tour, especially. And. Going They've got the, uh, what, uh, I'm trying to think, because I went uh, on my honeymoon down there. We went to Disney World. I think, they've what, they've got Universal Studios, mm -hmm. MGM Studios. Now it's a big touristy place, right? Yeah. <laughs> so what's that like? I know I was stationed in the Navy in Key West, Florida. Big tourist place down there. Uh, for the locals, they used to get aggravated because there are uh, so many tourists running around. What was it like growing up in, uh, in your hometown? And uh, it was kind of a tourist attraction. Um, just different, seeing a lot of different people coming in, like, in and out for, the, um, like, Disney and Universal and stuff like that. Now, give everybody this background here on in Oviedo. What's up with the chickens? <laughs> what What's up with the chickens in Oviedo? We just had a, a thing here in Cape Girardeau where people were lobbying the city council to see if they could keep chickens within the city limits, and it was a big – it was a big story for a while, and I guess they can keep chickens. They're just running all over the place in Oviedo, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, I don't know what to say about that. They've always been there around the church, so I don't know. So uptown, 
uh, around a church and these chickens just kind of run around and, and do they, do they do any special ceremony or anything? I mean, just what, what's the background here? Nothing. Just, they just run around the street all over the place. <laughs> you ever get anybody that, uh, just visiting your hometown and say, what's the deal with the chickens, man? Yeah. All my family from up North, they're like, what's on, what's going on with these chickens? So. <laughs> So the Oviedo chickens, you heard it here first. Uh, it is a big thing in uh, in his hometown. So Haggerty High School. Tell us about uh, tell us about playing at Haggerty. Um, it was a fun experience playing for Coach Cone. Um, just helping me develop as a young man and a player. And you guys uh, actually uh, played for a state championship, right? Yes, sir. My junior year. How'd that go? I, I know you finished runner up, but I mean yeah. the, the lead up. Uh, you know, making a run. Did you think that this was a state championship caliber team? When did you know maybe that you guys had a chance to make a run at a state title? And uh, did you have any close calls along the way in the state tournament? Um, well, going into Christmas break, we were six and five. And coach just told me, like, you need to, like, pick it up and if we want to go to um, Lakeland. So me and um, the seniors just picked it up and we got to Lakeland. Now, looking back now, you're six and five. I mean, how many six and five teams end up making a run to the state championship? Did you have any idea that you guys had that within you? No, not really. But I mean, just kept pushing and hoping for the best, and ended up there. All right. Uh, what was uh, what was the the big game as you guys went up to the state tournament? What was the the closest call or the most exciting few moments or the most exciting game that you had? Um, I'd say regional championship against Boone. I think it went to overtime. Yeah. How, to, how to get to overtime? Um, I think uh, my fellow teammate, Alex Keel, he shot a – I think it was a fadeaway at the elbow. And then we were down by two. And then it was like a second left, and I, like, put the ball back in after he missed the jump shot. So, so you actually tipped it in, yeah. a putback shot, to send it into overtime. Mm -hmm. And then how how'd overtime develop? Um – we're just trying to get stops, really, not really to, like focus on the offensive end because we knew like we would score eventually. So we're just trying to stop them from scoring. So that was the closest call. And then uh, who did you meet in the state championship and how did that game go? Uh, we played against Wellington High School. Um, I forgot where they're from, but um, it was just a close game, but going back and forth the whole time. And um, they just made a few more plays than we did and they ended up with the win. Wasn't one of those games where there was a bad call that you still that you still lie in bed at night thinking about, man, I, there's no way. I can't believe that whistle. Ooh. Sometimes that stuff happens. Yeah, it does happen. Um, last play of the game, uh, seven seconds left, I think it was. Their point guard, uh, Trent Frazier, he got the top of the key. And uh, he tapped the basket. And um, one of our seniors, Isaac Enzi, he reached. But, I mean, it was like end of the game, so they shouldn't have called it. But – uh, they called a foul, and he um, made the free throws to win the game. So that was it. I mean, they called a foul on the final play, guy yeah. shooting a three. What was the score at that time? Uh, it was, I think it was 65, 64. So it was a one-point game. Yeah. You guys had the lead, yeah. and they called a foul with what? how much time on the clock? Like three seconds. Left. Three seconds. And what, was it a three or a two? It was a two. A two. Yeah. So – it, it ended up being one of those where you're like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. Are you are you a proponent of when it's late in the game? Just just, just let's let's just play. Let's not have a whistle. Yeah, for sure. Well, it was kind of similar. Uh, you talked about uh, your uh, regional championship uh, and moving on where you hit the shot right at the end to tie the game. Kind of similar to what Jamal Calvin did on Saturday against Eastern Illinois. How big was that to, that shot to send the game into overtime? Yeah, that was big time. But, I mean, I trust him. Like, when he shot it, I was going to go in. He makes shots like that all the time in practice. So, I have faith in him. Well, he's having the best year of his four-year career. Uh, how about the uh, the way that you guys have been shooting the three-point shot? Boy, you guys have been tremendous. I don't know if you know this, but last year, Southeast was last in the league in three-point shooting. And this year, only uh, only um, Murray State and Moorhead State are shooting the three better. What what do you uh, what do you give? I, obviously, personnel is a big reason for the turnaround. But uh, it looks like you guys have a lot of confidence shooting the three. Yeah, well, it started all um, during the summer. Coach Spray really emphasized shooting and getting in the gym working on our shots. So I think that's um, 
the results from over the summer. Have you always been a, a really good three point shooter? I'd say so. A hundred and five uh, three point shots, third most in the entire state of Florida. Your junior year, you were seventh in the state of Florida in scoring at 24 points per game. Uh, did you have some other big scores on that uh, Haggerty team your junior year? Um, I think my teammate Alex averaged 15, maybe. 15, so you were the guy yeah. then. Yeah. I, what I think is interesting is you were named the 8A player of the year in the state of Florida, but only second team All-State. How does that happen? I wish I could tell you. <laughs> that's that's kind of like we've seen uh, – uh, we've seen like some SEMO uh, football players or, or uh, especially a baseball player was named a preseason All-American or he was named an All-American after the season, uh, but he was named second team All-Conference. Kind of doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But uh, so your junior year, tell us about the injury. When did it happen? Did it happen after the season was over? Was it AAU ball? Were you working out? Uh, tell us about the injury and just exactly what happened. Um, it happened to AAU. It was a tournament in um, Las Vegas. Um, I think it was the third game of the tournament. Um, the other team was inbound the ball at half court. Um, I was guarding my – well, I was supposed to be guarding my guy, but I wasn't really paying attention. And then he went back door, and he caught the ball. He went up for a layup, and then I went up to block it. And when I landed, I, um, my knee just went out, and it just felt different. So I was down and yelling and stuff. And yeah. So did, did you come down on someone's foot or you just came down awkwardly? Just on my I landed on, awkwardly on myself. So what's the first thing, you know, obviously there's pain, but uh, what's the first thing, uh, what's the first thing that's going through your mind? And then uh, what did the doctor tell you once, uh, once you had the MRI? Um, when it first happened, I was just, my brother was there and he was like telling me to calm down, but I was just like yelling, like I thought it was over because I never had a knee injury before, but I just thought it was over. And then um, the first doctor we went to that night, he said it was a strained patellar tendon. So I mean, Wait, that's good news. You, yeah. you're, at least you're thinking that's good news. Yeah. And then we went to a different doctor the next day, but it was pretty swollen, so he couldn't really tell. But he told my brother like it could be a torn ACL, but we have to see it back when I go back home. So. So you got the MRI. They told you torn ACL, and then what are your thoughts? I couldn't talk to anybody for like two days. I bet. And yeah. the, the good news is, uh, and I'm sure you probably were in communications, people probably reached out to you uh, who had similar injuries and the, the medicine and the technology now on torn ACLs. I mean, guys are, guys are coming back as good as they ever have. Uh, when you started to get encouraging reports, when the medical people were telling you, hey, it's, it's not the end of the world, you know, guys come back from this type of injury, did that kind of uplift your spirits a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Just knowing that I'll be able to come back and play basketball the game that I love. So, what were some what were some of the schools that were uh, recruiting you in addition to Southeast? Um, Jacksonville University, Chattanooga, Furman, Walford, Mercer, Gardner Webb. That was just a few. I'm curious because you were so close there in Orlando. Did you hear anything from Central Florida? They had to know all about you. Nothing. Nothing. So we need to, we need to get them on the schedule then, right? That's yeah. what you mean. I mean, that's a that's a thirty five point game. We go play Central Florida, yeah. right? Yeah. All right. Uh, so growing up uh, in the Orlando area, um, I'm trying to think when Shaq was there. He was probably already gone by the time you were growing up, or was he still there? No, uh, he was gone. Okay. Yeah. Penny Penny was gone. Yeah, he was. I don't know. I'm not even sure. Okay. Were you a Magic fan? No. My oh, dad okay. is. They're not good. <laughs> no, they're not good. So who who who'd you grow up uh, rooting for in college and uh, and pro ball? Um, college, I always liked Florida because of Billy Donovan. He's a good coach. Um, hmm. NBA team? I didn't really have one. I just like LeBron. That's a pretty good guy to like. Yeah. Yeah. He's pretty good. So you get here and you're six feet four and you're probably you've pre have you played the three your whole life for the most part? Yeah. Okay. So you're a three man. They probably recruited you as a three man. And then coach Ray sits you down and says, Denzel, we need you to be a four man. What were your first thoughts when, uh, when you heard that? Um, I was just open to anything, just willing to help the team however I can. But I guess when you're hearing, okay, you can play behind Antonius Cleveland and play about five minutes a game, or you can be a four-man and play about 30 minutes a game. How yeah. long did it take to make that decision? 
Um, not long at all. <laughs> I wouldn't think so. So how, how big of an adjustment was it for you? Because it is, I mean, you do some different things. I mean, it's, I know it's not completely different. They're not asking you to be a back-to-the-basket guy, but how much of an adjustment was it? Um, I think the like the bigger like the biggest thing was defensively playing against like six eight six seven like Dan, like nine and nine out. Yeah, and playing against Wayne Martin yeah. of Tennessee State guys mm-hmm. like that. But uh, I what I thought was interesting, you guys played against Tennessee State and Wayne Martin the first couple of times down the floor thought, okay, I'm gonna try to utilize my size advantage, and he did. Coach Ray gets a timeout. You guys make some adjustments, and we really didn't hear much more uh, out of him. Uh, you know, for the rest of the game. He didn't have a monster game. It looked like he might. What what kind of adjustments have you made throughout the season knowing that about everybody, at least when you're playing defense, is going to be bigger than you? Just stay in front and don't let them get it, like in front of me and duck in. So they're like, post me in. The cool thing for you, though, is, okay, guy, that's great that you're bigger than me. Now you got to come out and guard me. How cool is that? That's the best. Just knowing that. As bad as it is, me guarding them, they have to guard me, though. That's the, like the scary thing about it. Well, when you first started, and we talked with Coach Ray, uh, you were shooting a lot of threes, and that's fine. I mean, they want you shooting threes. I mean, with your percentage, you're a tremendous three-point shooter. I think eighth in the league uh, in conference games and three-point shooting percentage. Now, all of a sudden, we start to see your game evolve where you start to – I don't know if the coach has told you, hey, attack more. But, man, you have been attacking a lot more, and you're having a lot of success. Tell us about uh, how your game has kind of evolved going from more perimeter. You weren't exclusively a perimeter guy, but more perimeter, and now you're really getting to the basket, getting to the free throw line. Um, I think I'm just starting to use my size to my advantage and my quickness um, against the big guys and starting to get more comfortable like where I could like score and make plays for the team. You know, one thing I noticed, Coach Ray is always talking about the, the fact that uh, he'd like you to talk more or maybe show a little bit more emotion. I see you chirping at guys on the other team out there on the floor. <laughs> um, you talk a little bit to the other team, don't you? A little bit. <laughs> Tell us about uh, some of the teams that you've played so far. You don't have to, you don't have to name individuals, but uh, the teams that you've played so far, name some teams that really get the mouths running during a game. Oh, um, Tennessee State. How was Moorhead when you guys played them? Because I, I know their big guy. He was he was not only uh, talking to his teammates. He was talking to the Red Hawks. He was talking to the fans. In the I think he was talking to Joe Hobbs. Uh, Moorhead State. Uh, did did they do a little chattering? Um, not with me, but I heard them talking to the fans and stuff. That was pretty crazy. So as you, uh, uh, so you're a Billy Donovan fan. So he is now the head coach at Oklahoma State. Because you like Donovan, you kind of pay attention a little to Oklahoma State and what Russ, Russell Westbrook is doing? A little bit, but Katie left, so I don't really care anymore. Okay. So you're are you a Durant fan? Yeah. Yeah, what a great player. When you watch the way the Warriors play basketball, what do you think? Because it's kind of a different type of game that they play. <laughs> it's just unstoppable. You can't really stop, like, one person because you have to worry about all five of them. So you're a LeBron fan. You respect what Golden State has done. LeBron brings them back from 3-1 down. They win the title. Now they get KD. Does LeBron have enough this year when they inevitably meet in the NBA Finals? No. (laughs) But I don't think they can stop him. Yeah, And I heard that Kevin Love will miss the game tonight. He's got a swollen knee. I don't know the extent uh, of the knee thing with, uh, with Kevin Love for the Cleveland Cavaliers. All right. Uh, you celebrated your uh, 19th birthday, January 18th. Do you do anything special on your birthday? Stay in my room. All right. That's exciting stuff. It's <laughs> exciting stuff. Now, Oviedo, uh, how, man, I'm trying to think. Uh, I lived in Key West. So, man, that's, what's that? Maybe nine hours to drive to Cape Girardeau? How long of a drive is that for your family? Uh, 15, 16 hours. 15, 16. Yeah. People don't realize how long Florida is, man. That's a yeah. long drive. So do they get to do they get to come to Cape very often? Do they get to check out many of your games? Um, They came to the Indiana game, and they came to the – I think it was Henderson State and EKU, uh, 29th and 31st. Yeah. Okay. So they've been here a couple of times. Yeah. And uh, if you guys make the OVC tournament, might they be able to swing by Nashville? I hope so. Yeah. That'd be nice. All right. Well, you guys haven't locked up a spot yet, but you're certainly in a great spot to win 
uh, spot in the OVC tournament, and you're not done uh, as far as you know making a run at the OVC West Division Championship. What's the what's the team's thoughts here as you have three games left in the regular season? And good for you guys. You got them all at home. Um, I say just uh, um, keep winning at home and just try to fight for first, even though we were tied for first last game. Don't let the loss like get to us and just keep fighting for it. All right. Uh, so who do you hang out with on the team? Ray. Ray, and he's <laughs> here. All right. Uh, who's a better shooter, you or Ray? That's a tough one. All right. Well, we, we, <laughs> Ray doesn't think it's so tough. Ray's Ray's got an answer here. What do you What do you think? Uh, who cares about his answer? Yeah, it's a good call. Now, uh, here's my question: Can you dunk? Yes. I okay. Can. We are, are we when when when's the next time we're going to see a Mahoney dunk in a game? When Mahoney gets another fast break. By okay. Himself. All right. <laughs> Have you played with anybody? who can leap or dunk like Antonius Cleveland. You ever played with anybody that uh, that is as exciting as that guy? No, not at all. First time. You know, sometimes when Jalen throws those alley-oops, have you ever been on the floor and just thought it's too high? Yeah, There's no way that he's <clears throat> going to be able to go up and punch that, and all of a sudden there he is hanging on the rim. Not at all. When he throws it, like, I don't know who he's throwing it to, and I just see Antonius grab it. I was like, oh, there he is. Now, has Antonius pulled you aside and said, now, Denzel, let's get on page here. You need to get the you need to get the alley oop there for me. He's told me a few times. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, it's going to be UT Martin. Now uh, that's a tough team. You guys owe them. They beat you uh, in Martin, Tennessee. They've got a couple of really ex explosive three point shooters uh, in Butler and Mobley. They've got a guy named Kadar Edwards who is Mister Everything. I mean, scoring, rebound, steals. You know. Uh, you know, block shots. He's a really good player. They score a lot of points. So uh, what are your thoughts about UT Martin coming in here Saturday? Um, I think if we stick to our principles defensively, that on um, the offense is going to come, that will be successful. All right. Uh, back to back, 20 point games, 20 against SIU Edwardsville, 22 again. Well, you had 16 at halftime. What were you drinking in the first half on Saturday? Water. Okay. That's the secret <laughs> right there. Denzel, great to catch up with you, man. Uh, we'll see you Saturday. Best of luck in the final games of the season. And uh, I'm predicting now we're going to Nashville. So we'll see you in Music City as well. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. There he is, Denzel Mahoney, four-time OVC Freshman of the Week. We'll talk uh, real quickly with uh, Coach Ray about the upcoming UT Martin Skyhawk game when we come back. Coach's show, Wings, etc. on SEMO ESPN has been growing about Wings Etc. See, Wings Etc. has those award-winning jumbo wings. They're popular for both dine-in and carry-out. Now the word is getting out about Wings Etc.'s appetizer lineup. From the ultimate nachos to the deep-fried pickle spears, frankly, they're irresistible. Friends are sharing time together at Wings Etc. They've got dining rooms filled with HD TVs tuned to the best sports programming, including NFL Sunday Ticket. The people at the next table are talking about Wings Etc.'s daily half-pound lunch special, starting at just $6.49. Plus, Wings Etc. has food and drink specials throughout the week, including 59-cent wings every Monday. Plus, there's the kids' menu, and Wings Etc. is family-friendly with video games in the dining room. And the whole community is excited about how Wings Etc. is locally owned and operated, and they're proud to support local athletes, their families, schools, and teams. I guess Wings Etc. is a really big deal around here. And now, your ESPN Radio Network local, local weather forecast. Looking at clear skies, and 31 is where we're headed for the overnight low. That's actually a few degrees on the highest side of average. Some light winds also to deal with. We'll call it partly to mostly cloudy for our Monday. Run the temperature up to around 50, and then we'll build in the clouds for Monday night. Overnight low, mid to upper 30s. Looking at a sun and cloud mix Tuesday, and a high 54 for the weather channel. You're up to date with the latest weather forecast. Breaking on the ESPN Radio Network. This is your local home for Mike and Mike, the sports huddle, and all your favorite teams. Get it all right here. Makes my day go great. On the SEMO ESPN Sports Network. Welcome back. Final segment here with Coach Rick Ray. It is the Red Hawks Coaches Show at Wings, etc. in Jackson. And don't forget, 59 cents for their award-winning jumbo wings here. 
they were voted best wings in Southeast Missouri, People's Choice Award for the Southeast Missourians. So uh, they just don't hand those uh, those. Uh, awards out lightly that was voted on by the people that eat wings for a living and wings etc voted number one good food great times wings etc we're back at the cape location by the way next week all right coach rick ray is here and uh coach uh denzel mahoney uh would not go on record as to saying who was the better three-point shooter between kowalski and and Denzel, I like that kind of confidence in a guy, don't you? Well, I think the interesting thing is that we've got some empirical data of, of all the shooting drills in the summertime that that Ray um, shot a higher percentage than Denzel. But the thing I will say, we don't have any empirical data of him shooting better than him in games where it really matters at. So until Ray sets foot on the court and shoots a better percentage than Denzel, then we don't know with that empirical data insists. See, Denzel <laughs> agrees with that theory. He's shaking his head as he's enjoying the award-winning wings here at Wings, et cetera. I, I, I would say there were a lot of Hall of Fame baseball players in batting practice. Batting practice. How are you swinging it in a game is what you're saying. Exactly. Uh, and to me, that's, that's what matters. I always say, like, how do you do when the popcorn is popping? Yeah, get your popcorn. <laughs> All right. Uh, you've got UT Martin coming up, Coach. Uh, the one thing that jumps out with UT Martin is their ability to score, uh, their ability to hit three-point baskets. Uh, as we come in right now, they make they make nine threes a game. Only the Belmont Bruins, uh, who, by the way, got upset the other night by Tennessee Tech, so they're no longer undefeated. They're 12-1. and one. Only Belmont makes more three-pointers per game then UT Martin, they can fill it up. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, uh, Jacoby Mobley is a unique guy, and we showed our guys on film, both him and Butler. Most people come off of ball screens in order to get penetration. Most people come off of handoffs to get penetration. When they come off handoffs and ball screens, it's to shoot the ball. And so if you don't like, or if you don't arrive with the ball, if you don't have hands, if you don't have contact, as soon as they touch the ball, they're going to shoot it. They shoot more contested three-point off of ball screens and handoffs than anybody I've ever seen um, in my years of coaching college basketball. So they put that pressure on you to not make any mistakes on your handoff and ball screen defense. All right. Uh, Mobley hit five triples the first game. Uh, they won by 10 in Martin, and that game was on January 14th. He went five of nine, scored 25 points. Isn't it an advantage for you to – not just watch them on tape and hear the scouting report from you. You have to get on him to have played in a game and have him torch you for 25 points. Is that an advantage the second time around for your guys? Because it's not just the coach saying this, and I see how another team's defending him. That's not us. Having already played against him, Will it be an advantage the second time around, do you think? It's only an advantage if they listen to you <laughs> this is the second time around. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But to me, it's always better when you're showing your guys tape of, like, what they did against the previous team because a lot of times when you're showing them tape, you're showing, like, uh, Tennessee Martin against Tennessee Tech. You're showing them UT Martin against SIUE, and they're like, well, we won't make those same mistakes. Yes, you will, um, because these guys average a lot of points a game and, and they make a lot of threes. Um, so for us, we've got to make sure we're able to shut down those guys from getting those three point opportunities without opening up Pandora's box. Because sometimes when you take away something, what you don't want to do is have them go do something different. And they're more than capable of, of putting the ball on the deck and making plays and and driving and making plays for others. And then also sometimes you get so wrapped up with that guy coming off the ball screen action, the guy who handed the ball off the big or the guy who set the ball screen the big gets open on the dive or on the pop. So you've got to be able to rotate to that guy because you're so concerned about those guys being able to shoot threes. And the other thing that they do that's really unique, they play 100% zone. But they, they never play man-to-man -man defense, so it's a matchup zone at that. It's not your typical 2-3 or 3-2 or 1-3-1. It's a matchup zone that bends. And so what you've got to do is you really got to kind of run some sort of a man-to-man -man offense against that matchup, but it's got to have some zone principles in it too. So fortunately, we've got a week, and, and Coach Lagrune, Nick Lagrune, has that scout, and we'll sit down and we'll look at I, I had him pull like, 
how are people scoring against that? What happened in that occurrence? And so we're going to look at that and see what we can do to tweak our offense, our man offense, to be able to attack that unique man, uh, matchup zone. And one thing to keep in mind, when they beat you in Martin, you did not have Trey Kellum. That was one of the five games that he did not play, and I don't know how much of a difference it would have made. There would have been a difference. Uh, William Chenga was starting at that time, did not score two rebounds in eight minutes. Uh, no, I'm sorry, you did have Kellum. Uh, he, can't, that was, he was just coming back from the injury, and you were bringing him off the bench. So he wasn't 100%. So eight points, 30 minutes from Trey Kellum in the first game. Make sure I adjust that. But at that time, Chenga was still in the starting lineup. Yeah, uh, Chenga did a good job for us on the defensive. I mean, he's such a presence. Um, being able to like play ball screen defense, that's what he does best, and he's really active on the defensive end for us. You know, obviously his 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 scoring has got to grow for us, and we knew that when we recruited him. But uh, Trey wasn't nearly a hundred percent at that yeah. point in time, and so hopefully he's able to make a difference because a lot of times when you hear zone. All everybody thinks about is you got to make threes, you got to make threes. And that's that's not the case at all. They're playing zone because they can't guard you. And so we've got to be able to beat them off the bounce. we got to get the ball into the paint. And then once we have that paint attack, then we can kick out and make threes. And the guy who wasn't thinking just jack threes against the zone was Denzel Mahoney, 12 for 12 from the free throw line in that game. So he was attacking the zone. Yeah, and that's what I think you have to do. Zone has gaps. And what you have to do is attack those gaps, and you got to have the courage enough to go attack those gaps, draw two, and, and then once you draw two, make that decision. I think a lot of times, once people you hear them attack the gaps, attack the gaps, they draw two when they're trying to finish against two. Well, no, you don't want to do that either. What you want to do is attack that gap, draw two, and kick to an open teammate. All right, one one real one note about the 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 second half of the Eastern Illinois game. That was really something we haven't seen all year. I mean, you couldn't buy a basket in the second half. People say, what happened in Eastern Illinois? You, yeah, you could buy a bucket. It seemed like nothing was falling. You couldn't buy a bucket in overtime. That's something that we haven't seen a whole lot of really struggle for you guys this year. Yeah, and you know, that's the point to me about that game was we talked about really good at defending the rim because of the drama. Um, he, he's an elite shot blocker. I'm pretty sure he's leading our league yes. in, in shot blocking. But not only does he block shots, he affects so many more. And so I thought we too many times drove the ball in there, which is what we want. I was I was happy with the fact that we were getting paint attacks. But I told our guys, it's a decision that you make once you get to the paint. And once we got to the paint, I thought far too many times we challenged him instead of kicking the ball out for open threes or easy uh, attempts for the second paint attack. And that's the reason why I think we struggled on the offensive end. Two teams ahead of you in the standings. Murray's a half game up. Um, UT Martin is one game up. Those are your next two opponents. So you, you, you at least control your destiny against those two teams. And, and to me, this is something, and um, I really don't want this to come across the wrong way, so I hope no one takes it this way. But this is what like our community and our students and our fans have wanted. They wanted us to have a chance to challenge for an OVC West championship. And that moment is here now after just one year of us being here as a coaching staff and our players. And so in order for us to be successful and have a chance to win an OVC West, we need our fans. I mean, there is no home court advantage if we just go out there and play and say we're playing at home. No, in order for us to have a home court advantage, we need an environment in that home court advantage. And we need the students. We need the, the community. They need to come out and support this team in, in our chance to have an uh, opportunity to win the OVC West. So I would hope that the community and our fan base and our students really take advantage of this opportunity of being able for us to challenge in the OVC West and come out and support us because it would mean the world. It would mean the world to our guys to have a great environment when they go out there and try to win an OVC West Championship. 11 a.m. Do you like that start time? Well, for me, I mean, it. I'm not playing, <laughs> so it, it doesn't matter to me. I'm just coaching ball. I'll coach ball at midnight. I'll coach it at 2 a.m. in the morning. I'll coach it at 11 a.m. Um, so it doesn't matter to me, but it's like – does it affect our guys? And, and to me, I would hope it does not affect our guys because, you know, you get an opportunity to play basketball. You get an opportunity to compete. I don't care when it happens. You got to go out there and do it. So if our guys are using that as an excuse, then they're not real competitors. Um, so I, I would think that this shouldn't be a problem at all. We're gonna. The thing I love about early games, and this is I love breakfast food. 
And, and so, like, when we have our training table meal, like our, our pregame meal, and we have breakfast, like, I'm all in on that. So anytime we play early, like at noon or 2 o'clock, and we have breakfast food, I love that pregame meal. All right. It'll be pregame breakfast food on Saturday, 11 a.m. Women play at 1.30. Big games for both the men and the women. Coach, best of luck on Saturday, and uh, we'll talk to you next uh, Monday on the Coaches Show. Thank you very much. Coach Rick Ray, and uh, our thanks also to the – OVC Freshman of the Week for the fourth time, Denzel Mahoney. Stay tuned. Rosillo and Canal coming up next on ESPN Radio. So long, everybody.